Log on, tune in, find out. Another good idea from Cambridge. Robin's a professor of mathematical biology at the University of York and has been so since uh, 2009, she first moved to York in 2005 uh, from the City University uh, in London, which was your first, I believe, appointment in the UK. Uh, Bryden uh, is a very eminent uh, mathematical biologist and has been a London Mathematical Society a popular lecturer. She's spoken at the British Association Science Festival and she also speaks at many international conferences. So without further ado, can I introduce Thank Brian? you very much for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here at the New <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. This is actually the place I've been sitting in 2004 in a Newton Institute program where I actually got in contact with biologists. I've been a mathematician or mathematical physicist before I actually worked in mathematical biology. And at that time, actually, due to one of those programs, I got in contact with biologists. And then we built up over the years these joint research programs that are now basically have led to a lot of joint, paper, uh, joint papers, to joint book, to a lot of output, a conference series. So all of this comes out of the Newton Institute here, I should say. So it's a very special place for me to be here. So what I should say is that being a mathematician is not enough kind of if you want to work in the area of mathematical biology because you need to have the input from biophysics, from biology, from all the other sciences and bring all of that together. So what I've done is actually to build up a research team which has very different expertise. So it combines bioinformatics, computational chemistry, physics, biophysics and all sorts of mathematics together to actually answer some open problems in virology. And I'm here today to talk to you a bit about our research program in mathematical virology, as we call it, and share a few of our excitement and our results with you. So viruses under the mathematical microscope is the title of this talk. And before I can actually look at them with a the mathematical microscope, I should give you a brief introduction what viruses actually are. So in a nutshell, if you think about a virus, think about a protein container that packages the genomic material, which could either be RNA or DNA. So basically, in, a, in its very simplest form, it's a container with genomic material. There can be a lot of complications. There are different strategies for viruses to infect their hosts, for which they require different components. But in a nutshell, this is sort of what you want to picture. And this container has a very important function. It is actually acting like a Trojan horse. It is bringing genomic material into the cellular environment. It is infecting a cell. It's hijacking the mechanism of a cell in order to reproduce and uh, create new viral particles. So all of these aspects from the formation of these containers, the packaging up to the infection are all stages of the viral life cycle we are interested in from a mathematical point of view. And I'm going to give you a flavor of the types of mathematics we are going to use in this context. Now, just to set the scale for you, viruses are very, very small. So a medium-sized virus next to a flea is about the same as if you look at a human next to twice the size of the Mount Everest. So it's very, very small. And this has additional complications for the biology or for the biological colleagues who want to look at these viruses under the microscope because actually you can't just use a light microscope that you might be familiar with but actually you have to use something what's called an electron microscope so we are radiating electron beams at your sample at your virus rather than light beams and this is necessary because it is so very small and I've given you here a rough idea about those dimensions so here one meter I've put for a person so it's more me with one meter fifty um, an apple about here, an ant here, a hair here. This is all things you can see with the bare eye. But then, when you want to see cells, you have to go further down to um, with a light microscope. But then, if you want to see viruses, actually, even the light microscope isn't sufficient anymore. So to look at viruses or DNA or RNA, the genomic material, what you really need to do is radiate it with these electron beams. So what we are focusing on is this 
length scale here where the viruses live. And because of this, what happens is that you need to interpret these so-called electron micrographs. So what you see up here is a picture of what my colleague in the biology sees when he looks under the micro microscope, electron microscope, at viruses. And I must say that we can't just look at them like that. We have to actually cool the samples because viruses would otherwise be deteriorating in their structures from these beams. So we do something in addition. We cool them quite strongly. This is why we call it cryo-electron microscopy. So very highly cooled samples being radiated by electron beams. And as you can see here, you get quite a good idea about those containers. But actually, if you want to learn more about those surface structures where the mathematical predictions come in and these surface structures which are important for infection, for how basically the virus presents itself to uh, receptors of a cell, for instance, you need to have more resolution, as we say, more clarity in the picture. And this, as you can see, is very difficult from a single such micrograph alone. But what people are doing is what we call icosahedral averaging, and you'll learn more about this later from me. So this is actually, we use the symmetry um, properties of these viruses in order to interrogate their shapes. So what I'm going to tell you quite soon on the mathematical side of things, it's very important, first of all, to at all create from those micrographs structures that tell you something about the fine details of these viruses. And if you use this mathematics, actually then you can see these containers quite clearly and you can zoom in on the surface of, of these containers. So here basically I'm showing you in magnification this area of the viral capsid and here you see um, what looks like a donut shape which is actually what we call a hexamer because it is composed of six individual proteins. So in order to show you the proteins which are the building blocks of my container I zoom into this donut shape even more and what you see here is what we call a hexamer. There are six different proteins, which in fact actually are identical, but I give it different, I give them different colors so that you can better see which belongs to which protein. And what we endeavor with our mathematics is actually to com predict the layouts of these features, the layouts of these containers. This is where we are going to head today. So I show you that actually with known mathematics, you can go a certain way to learn things about viruses and then our research group came in and developed new mathematics because for first and foremost I'm a mathematician I'm excited by developing new mathematics so we developed some new mathematics that allows us to zoom even further into these structures so that's why I called the talk a mathematical microscope because really these techniques allow you to zoom into these surface features of the viruses. Now, I should say that there are very different containers, and that's also why it's very interesting for us. They come in different sizes and different shapes, but they share properties. And this is, again, what mathematics is all about. It's a common language. There are common building principles that apply to all of them, even if they are looking very diff different. And this is what's here. These viruses actually follow the same structural mechanisms, but they interpret them, if you wish, in a different form. So what they present to you is different surface structures, but following the same rule set that we're going to explore today. So this is the common cold virus that you all have been <laughs> familiar with, unfortunately, at some point in your life. So there are other viruses. This one is one that causes cervical cancer. It's a class of cancer-causing viruses. So all sorts of medically really important viruses you're probably familiar with from daily life in one way or the other actually can be described with this theory that I'm going to present to you today. And obviously, I should say there are a lot of viruses that haven't been explored yet. There's a whole zoo out there. And here is one, if anybody has an idea after my talk how to describe this one. I'll be happy to hear about it. Now, here comes the first alert. And you will see several of those alerts during my talk. We have actually prepared outside computer presentations for several uh, aspects of my talk that I'm going to uh, introduce to you today um, so that you can actually explore the 3 d geometry yourself. Many things I'm going to tell you today, if you look at them from just one angle, that gives you some sort of an idea, but the moment you are 
rotating them yourself, you're zooming in on them, you actually really see what's at the heart of that geometry. So one of those computers outside, and there are four people from my group here, I'll tell you afterwards who they are at the end of my talk, will be close to those computers and they will help you with manipulating these, um, these files so you yourself can actually rotate and zoom into these structures and play with these structures and see our models and what they're actually saying about these viruses. And whenever this um, explore outside after the talk sign is coming up, this means there will be an opportunity for you later, if you're interested in this particular aspect, to go to the computer and explore it yourself. Right, so I think it is quite instructive to see the infection process in action, and there are actually structures which are called bacteriophages. They are like viruses, but they are infecting bacteria. And here's an example of a bacteriophage, it's called T4, which infects a cell here, um, and a bacterium, I'm sorry, a, um, a bacterium, E. coli bacterium. And what I'm going to show you is actually how these, this infection process happens. And I've brought for you, so there was health and safety here, so I wasn't allowed to bring my actual viruses, they only allowed me the, the, the models. So what I was bringing here is actually precisely those. A bacteriophage has a head, which is very much like the viruses, the, the other the human viruses, but in addition, it has what we call the phage tail, which it uses, as you will see in the movie in a minute, to inject genomic material into the bacterium it's infecting. So I can probably give some people in the front to look at it. So we can pass them around, and if you pass them back to me afterwards, that would be <coughs> nice if people want to see. So this is now a movie courtesy to Michael Rossman's lab which shows how this infection process would happen for a phage. So this phage is basically landing on a bacterium here, and you will see when it lands and positions itself, it then is using this so-called fa um, phage tail to bring the genomic material inside of the bacterium. So you can literally see it's contracting the tail and the genomic material will now be injected. There are different infection mechanisms. This is only one of many, but it is one which is quite um, impressive, I would say, because you can quite nicely see with this tail how the infection happens. <coughs> so uh, what we are particularly interested in is are these heads. So what phages have in common with viruses are these heads and are the symmetry or mathematical properties of these heads. And what we need to understand here are basically symmetry groups. That's what we call them in mathematics. So as you can see, this container looks very much like this shape, which we are calling an icosahedron in mathematics. And what is characteristic of the icosahedron is the symmetry axis, the rotational symmetry axis it has. And the reason why we're interested in this is because if we understand basically the building principles underlying these containers, then we can come up with antiviral strategies that help us to inhibit the formation of the viruses and or the, the, the viral containers and come up with new antiviral therapeutics. So the language of symmetry in a nutshell first to pick everyone up. So you're all familiar with reflection symmetry. Basically, your body has reflection symmetry. Your two sides sort of map onto each other. But what we are actually talking about today are rotational symmetries. <coughs> so you can see them in a very simple form by imagining that an axis or a kind of a stick comes out of the center of the structure. And here, if I rotate twice, uh, if, um, if I rotate by half a full circle basically around it, then I'm getting the structure back. So I have to rotate twice to come back to the original shape. Here this is in a factor of three, so a third of a rotation brings me to the shape, and if I do it three times, I'm back to the original shape. Similarly with four shapes here. And again, you have a lot of examples in nature and observe that this is actually rotational symmetry, so the axis sticks here <coughs> to the center. It's not a reflection symmetry because then the heart would have to be up here. It is actually really a rotational symmetry, and the same here on that sign or on this lucky glover here. It's basically a rotational symmetry that describes the structure. And the viruses we are looking at is the same idea, just with a very specific set of such symmetry axes. 
And these are what we call twofold, threefold, and fivefold axes because, again, the same idea twofold if you need twice that rotation to get back to the original, to say, the identity to where you started, or threefold or fivefold, conversely, if you need more of a rotation to come back. And the twofold axes actually are always in the centers. It goes through the centers of this icosahedron, as we call it. So if you take an edge, the center of an edge, and you put an axis through this in the center of the structure, then this defines the rotational symmetry axis, and I can sort of rotate around it. Similarly, if I put an axis at one of those vertices of what we call these corner points of the structure, and the center, this is a five-fold rotational symmetry axis. I need five rotations by fifths of a full circle to get to to get the structure back. And similarly for the threefold axis, they are sitting in the centers of these faces as we call them, the triangles, and go through the center and of the face and the center of the structure. And what's really important for us is to realize what these operations are doing for you because we're doing afterwards something which we call affine extensions of symmetry groups. So it's very important that you get a feeling for what a symmetry group actually is. So therefore, I would like to invite you all to play football with me. And please hand them back after the talk if you can. So we are <laughs> sorry, I'm not sure if I can reach without killing all the mics on the way. <laughs> so you will need this to <laughs> sorry, the small ones as well. Um, to participate. So what we're going to do, oops, I try, if you can hand some further down because I can't really <laughs> throw them <laughs> well enough to the, to the back of the room. Um, so what we're going to do is now what we call a composition of symmetry operations. If someone wants to do here. <laughs> Does it here as well. So just pre pass them around in the chair for <laughs> catching for everyone. Um, so what we are trying to do is to use two different combinations of symmetry operations to achieve the same results. I'm sorry, <laughs> there's more coming. So there's <coughs> some more here. <laughs> I don't know if someone. Has, oh, sorry, I've got two more, so I just throw it in the in the back. <laughs> sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Probably, hopefully, no casualties at the end of this talk. So um, the idea here is basically, if you can do it with me together. So think, take your football, and we're starting in the corner of one of these five-fold patches. So it's a pentagonal patch, a patch with five corners. And we are basically, you might want to just put your finger there and hold this. So now I can do two operations, symmetry operations, one after the other to um, achieve, um, uh, to, to uh, end up here. So how do I do this from here? I now realize that there is a two-fold symmetry axis on the e in the center of this edge um, between the two hexagonal shapes. Yeah? If you got that, imagine you stick an axis through that center and you rotate by 180 degrees about this axis. What you achieve is that this corner will actually end up on the opposite side. So you've used a two-fold axis of rotational symmetry to put your point on the opposite side of that edge. Yeah. And now, once you've done that, so this point has now been moved here, basically, so it's been moved from here to here. Now I use the fact that actually this five-fold patch I started off with has a five-fold symmetry axis. So you want to use the five-fold symmetry axis in the center of the five-fold patch we started off with. And now I rotate about this axis <coughs> by a fifth of a rotation. So that would mean that this point is now moving over here. So this is the rotation axis. My point is here. It's an edge away. So instead of being along this edge, it's now along this edge. So what you have achieved mathematically, we say you have composed to symmetry operations. And it has basically transported your point up to here. OK. Now we do something different. We start again. Remember that. You've done that. You know how to do that. So now we start with this point again. And now we use a three-fold axis instead. We use, there's a hexagonal shape here where this point basically, say this point is close to an edge. And if you take the hexagon that has this edge um, as one of its six edges, and if you now rotate by a three-fold rotation yeah, around this axis, 
So we are basically rotating clockwise around it. So if you take this axis, then this point will go here. Yeah. And if you do that, and what you see, what you learn is what the mathematician is calling an identity, which means you can achieve the same result by different compositions of your base symmetry operations. So you can, you can actually achieve the same end result in different ways. And this is what we basically note in terms of what we say identities. So the mathematician basically writes down if I compose R2 with R5, I'm getting R3. And this is very important for you to know for what's coming further. So the, the, you need kind of to have a quite visual understanding of a symmetry group. And in a sense, these operations that you've just carried out, imagine each of these operations as a person. And they form a group together. So this is a group of people. And in the same way, your operations form a group of operations, we say. So and us, people have relations with each other. These group operations have relations with each other. So it's very much the same. Always think about a group of people and relations between people. So later on, we're speaking about extensions. But before we do that, we want actually to see what we can learn from the symmetry group alone as it stands. So the symmetry group obviously is a concept that's around in mathematics for quite a while, so that's not new. But we want to see what it tells us. So what is really, really interesting is that this icosahedral group, which is the symmetry group of the icosahedron or of the viruses or of the football you've been playing with, it's very special because it has 60 members. It has 60 elements, or if you think in terms of people, there are 60 people in that group. And what that means is actually similar to what you've just done. If I take my icosahedron and I put my finger in the corner of one of these triangular faces, and then I use all these 60 different <coughs> elements, as we say, members of my group, then with each of them I transport this point to one of the other locations here, such that in the end I cover ever, every triangular face of the icosahedron with exactly three dots, which are all in the corners. And this is extremely important because it tells us that the whole architecture, the whole structure of this shape is actually determined by this symmetry group. Now, something even more important I have to tell you about the icosahedral group, and this is you can actually enumerate, and again, this is mathematics that's around for a long while, you can enumerate the symmetry groups in three dimensions, and you can look at the number of elements, i.e., at the member group members, the people in your group, right? H how many members are in the different groups? And if you look in your classification and see which of those in my classification has the largest number of such members, so if I speak about rotational symmetries, I should say, then the rotational symmetries of the icosahedron or its dual, the dodecahedron, are the largest because they are the 60. And this is actually very important for us. And again, I just flag this up. You can both, we have presentations on platonic solids to get more explanation for them. And we can also, children can construct them themselves in one of the rooms outside afterwards. But why is that important? Well, this is important for what we call genetic economy of a virus. Because this means if a virus uses this symmetry group, what it achieves is it has to code for only one type of protein and then can repeatedly use it, can repeatedly synthesize it. And if it builds a container with icosahedral symmetry, it can actually accommodate 60 copies of it with the icosahedral symmetry. So it, gets, it gives me, for a given protein size, a much larger container than I would get when if any other symmetry group, finite symmetry group, in three dimensions because they would all have less elements so your containers would naturally be smaller. So this is why the um, symmetry is actually very important for the virus to have. But the world would be boring if that was the end of the story because obviously 60 elements would be quite a strong limitation for viruses. And that was already um, ex observed in the 60s by Kasper and Kluge, a very important seminal work which shows how you can accommodate larger viruses in that framework. And what they introduce is something that's called quasi-equivalence. This is to say, how can I basically introduce further proteins such that all the proteins have similar local environments? So if I place myself on any of these uh, proteins, then what it locally sees 
is the same or similar to what the other proteins see. In mathematical terms, this would be the question, can I tessellate the surface of the icosahedron with one type of shape, say a triangulation, a triangle, such that every little triangle now has the same interpretation as before. These are so-called local symmetry axes, as opposed to the global ones. Well, this one now tends to coincide with the global, but let me take this one. This is just a local one. And then again, you have these three proteins basically around this little local axis. And this you can enumerate, so this has been done, basically, and the, the mathematics of this is actually quite intuitive and quite simple. So you take your icosahedral shape, and you do what we call a planar embedding. And a planar embedding is a fancy word for me just cutting it open, such that I have, at the end of the day, the surface of it flat on the table. This is what we call a planar embedding. So basically, I'm cutting it. And by cutting it, what I achieve is that I can super impose it on a hexagonal grid. And this is what we're going to do. I take my surface and I'm putting it on top of a hexagonal grid. And that's what they have done. And here you see different ways. And there is only there are strong limitations. There is a discrete series, as we say. There are only certain ways in which you can do that. So certain inequivalent ways in which you can do that. And these are the first three, the smallest three you can do. And then obviously you can allow your shape to be scaled larger and you can the sort of accommodate more hexagons on the surfaces. You can also rotate it. But the offshot is that it's actually very, very limiting as to what you can do. And the way it is then interpreted is again in terms of triangulations. I'm now placing a dot say in the center of every hexagon next and then I connect them to see the triangles and in each of those three cases I'm just highlighting one of those triangles for you so you can basically see how the small triangle that I've created sits in the large triangular faces of the icosahedron which are the red shapes here and the way this is interpreted is by closing the shape up again I can go back to its original form and then the rule would be, again according to quasi-equivalence, just to place the locations of the proteins in the corners of these smaller triangles. And then you can readily read off what your virus must look like. It has these clusters of five, which we call pentamers, around the five-fold axis. And it has clusters of six, which are more and more frequent the larger you are going with your structure. And you see there is a loud series. You haven't got the freedom, if you want icosahedral symmetry and you want quasi-equivalence, to place a random number of proteins. The mathematics actually tells you what is at all possible. And that gives you control, because you actually know something that we sometimes call a no-go theory. You actually know what's possible and what's not possible. And actually, what's quite remarkable about this work is that this has been done theoretically and subsequently Experiments have been carried out over the years, and for all of the structures at the start, I've seen infinite series, not for the very big ones, but for all of the structures at the start of their series, viruses have been discovered, and we are classifying them according to what we call T numbers, and this is just a fancy word for counting how many small triangles fit a large triangle. Okay, so this is, a, uh, and I should say this can be done obviously with large and larger structures. This is a hepatitis virus here, and you see that it's uh, just a triangulation that's correspondingly larger than the ones we've looked at before. Again, this is something you can explore later outside and uh, build one of them yourself. But here I come to the point, here we're coming to the end of the road where this sort of intuitive bit of mathematics is useful for us because actually, um, there are viruses that do not fulfill these criteria. And again, the theory is, is, is fundamental and very important for us because every quasi-equivalent virus is covered by it, and this is a tremendous achievement. The problem is, however, that some viruses are non-quasi-equivalent. So then, naturally, you need an extension of the theory, and this is what you can do with so-called tiling theory, and we're going to look at this. So what you see here is the surface of a virus that does not fulfill these typical patterns of 12 pentagonal clusters and otherwise hexagonal clusters. But actually, so this is like just a part of its surface, 
everywhere you look, you have a cluster of five. So it's a cartoon which shows you the relative placement of these clusters of five. And these are very important viruses. These are these cancer-causing viruses, so it's very important to understand them better. And you need different types of mathematics to do that. And so what's actually the problem? Well, it's actually easy to tell you what the problem is. Think about trying to tessellate your bathroom. So if you do this with square tiles, as you usually do, you know, no problem. You can do it with hexagonal tiles. You can do it with triangles. But if you try to do it with pentagons, you run into trouble because you get these gaps in between <coughs> them. And this is what the mathematician calls a crystallographic restriction. So basically, these are what we call non-crystallographic groups. This means for us that the long-range order that we usually get from a tessellation um, that is a lattice, as we say, so where you use the same shape and glue it to itself to fill the whole space, doesn't work for non-crystallographic structures. You need something different to, to explain the long-range order. And this is precisely what we're going to do here. If we want to use five-fold symmetry, we need something that describes long-range order without being periodic. And actually, the solution is out there in nature. In the 80s, there was a big buzz in the crystal uh, crystallography community when people discovered what's called a quasi-crystal. So this is a structure, again, has signatures of long-range order, but it is not periodic. And that meant it was not following a lattice, a periodic structure. It was following something different, but there was order. And people were setting out to define that order. And one of the pioneers, and I should say actually he came up with the Penrose tiling before quasi-crystals were actually discovered. But this is exactly the mathematics that it is, is describing these sort of structures. Um, it's what we call, in this case, a Penrose tiling after an eminent mathematician, Sir Roger Penrose from Oxford, who actually explained that you can have this long-range order as long as you use these different types of shapes. You can still have, um, basically, you can create local, as you see, these five-fold clusters. They are like groups of five around these centers here. But if you go further out from there, then you don't see sort of this five-fold rotational symmetry anymore. And the question is, how can we understand this? And there's a whole theory about this, which is called tiling theory. There are different types of mechanisms by which we import the order in a lower dimensional space from order in a higher dimensional space. And I'm not going too much into detail on that aspect of it, but what I want to tell you is you could basically look in three dimensions and use tiles and shapes that are induced, if you want, that we are deriving from lattices in a higher dimensional space, and they are fitting together to form these extended structures that actually have these five-fold symmetry axes and also local five-fold symmetry axes. And again, you're invited to explore this after your talk. The PhD student working on that project is actually with us, David Salthouse, will um, later on be at the computers, and you can actually rotate these tilings and, and see what, actually see the shapes, because often you see it better when you rotate it, actually, um, how, how it's happening. But I want to say a bit more about it. So if we, we have in developed something that we call viral tiling theory, and this is basically um, allowing for non-quasi-equivalent situations. So we allow for different types of shapes to tessellate surfaces. And this is basically the tiling that um, is the solution for this virus that has only five-fold clusters, which was this puzzle that I mentioned before. And I would like actually to zoom in a bit more on this and explain a very important feature about this tessellation. Because if you look at it, you see that you need three different types of shapes to describe its surface structure. And these shapes actually have a meaning biologically. Now, I should say that these first, these clusters obviously are the building blocks. So individual proteins become clusters of five, and clusters of five come together. But the meaning of these shapes is how do these clusters interact with each other, hold on to each other, we say bond with each other, in order to keep the structure in place. And this can be very nicely explained with balls of wool. So a protein is, in a sense, we call it a polypeptide chain, it's a chain, but you might just think about a ball of wool, actually, with two ends. And if you have something like, if you have a kite shape here, which accommodates the location of three proteins from three different clusters, and you wonder how they're interacting with each other, 
Well, whenever there is a kite shape, it tells you it's a trimer interaction, we say. It's an interaction in which all three participate. And the way it works is that one of them in extends an arm to another, but yet receives an arm from a third. So basically, the three of them work together as a team. But if I have a dimer here, which is only accommodating two proteins, then actually they extend and receive an arm from the opposite partner. So it is only two proteins engaging with each other. So this is the difference, and this mathematics actually tells you the dimer and trimer interaction. So there is actually a meaning to the mathematical shapes in this model. And again, you can explore a bit more about this outside. But I would like to come to something really, really exciting for us. So the real excitement actually starts for us in many ways um, here, because I, until now we talked about symmetry groups. We talked about the finite groups that have been around for so long. But there is a concept in mathematics that's been well developed for these crystallographic group that goes with lattices, but that has not been developed before for the non-crystallographic group. And the reason for that is that there are mathematical difficulties. As soon as it becomes non-crystallographic, certain properties <coughs> break down, so you can't rely on certain sort of uh, facts that you have in place for the others. But the concept underlying it is extremely simple, and I'd like to share it with you. So here's again my symmetry group that we have started off with and you played with on the football. And now all I'm doing is I'm inviting some other member into this group, but this other member actually is of a different nature than the, uh, the, the, the group members of your original group. So here, for simplicity, I show you the idea for pentagon. I'm not using the icosahedron, it's a bit more complicated on the icosahedron to visualize. So think about a pentagon and think about an axis sticking out to the center of this pentagon. It's what we say a rotational symmetry, which is fivefold. You know, fifths of the rotation you need to transport yourself from one corner to the next corner. Now, all our group members, like for the Icosido case, have the following property. They only move objects in a certain radial distance from the center around the center. They will never go away from the center. They are always hopping around the center. But the new person you're inviting in is doing something different. It's not keeping the center fixed anymore. The new person is what we call a translation. That's when I'm walking, I'm translating myself. I'm not rotating, I'm translating. This is what this person is doing. And you see here this green pentagon is what we say translated version, a version that has been moved away from the center of the structure. And this is basically the intuitive idea underlying the mathematics we're going to discuss now. Obviously, not every translation is mathematically meaningful, and the interest lies in finding these so-called extended symmetry groups that have nice mathematical properties, nice structures to classify them and to analyze them better. And this is where sort of the mathematical excitement in this project is for us. Now, what's happening though? So we've seen we are translating. Now, as you've done before, you can compose every element. As soon as you invite anybody into your group, you're allowed to use them all with each other at in any kind of combination. This is part of being a symmetry group. Like you can sort of compose them with each other. So the rotational symmetries are still there. So I can now use them again, actually. So what I'm doing now, again, remember the rotational symmetries are fivefold rotations about the center of this pentagon. And after I've done my translation, I'm now free to do these rotational symmetries again. That's what I'm doing. And if I continue doing this job, then you see what I'm getting. I'm getting sort of, if you want, a packing of these pentagons around this red pentagon we started off with. And if you use good translations, and again, this is for the mathematician, we define properly what this means and classify them all, you always have certain nice properties such as, you see, when I translate and rotate, I have some of these corner points, these vertices, coincide. This is something that makes it a, leads to what we ca call non-trivial group relations in the end, and hence to interesting mathematical structures. And what I'm going to do now, next for you, is basically to assume this construction, but I take away all these edges because they're actually aux auxiliary. They're only there for you to see the pentagon, but actually the vertices are what encode my group generators and what the group generators have actually done. So 
So I actually only think in terms of these called point arrays in the end. And we've done the same thing in 3D. So you can do the same concept in three dimensions. You obviously have to worry about which shapes to translate and so on and so forth. There's a whole theory about it. And we're happy to talk to you outside about the nitty gritty of it. But what I would like to take you, you to take on board is the fact that what you're ending up with are again, as much as here, nested point arrays. And the beauty of it is there are only a finite number of those. So you can classify them. It's not an infinite set. It's actually restrictive. And what I'm going to show you now is that these are actually geometric boundary conditions on the layouts of these viruses, on the full 3D structure of these viruses. And here is the first test case I'm going to discuss with you. And that was actually quite <coughs> interesting how this came about. This is my colleague I mentioned earlier who I met in the Newton Institute when I was here for this program. And actually, we were organizing a workshop together as a satellite for the Newton Institute. And he came to my office. And he saw our point arrays, and he said to me, well, that looks very much like our um, density of RNA within the bacteriophage MS2. And I said, oh, this is interesting. Let's have a look. So he basically brought to the table these sort of structures here. So what this is, is again, um, on the outside here, this, this sort of rim around it is the protein container. we are sort of looking into the virus as a cross-section of a virus. So what you see on the outside in different views, it's a two-fold, three-fold, and five-fold view, um, you see the protein container. And inside, you see two shells of viral RNA. This is an RNA virus or RNA phage. And this is actually quite a characteristic feature of the virus. And the question is, is it possible to predict this via mathematics? Are there mathematical constraints on my structure that actually force the virus to take on this peculiar shape? So he came with this, and I should say this is a, a, a joint work also with a Cryo M uh, person in near Ransom in Leeds, Tom Keefe, one of my postdocs who's not here today, and Jess Wagman, who is actually here, and will tell you more about her work as well. So it's somewhere in the audience, let's see. So what we have is the models. So if you just look at the models, what you're seeing is this. So what we do is we use the models, and uh, Jess has developed an algorithm that without us looking at the structure, actually picks the right point array for a virus, given information only on, in, on the protein container. We are not using any knowledge about the organization of the genomic RNA. And this is quite important because we want to predict it. So we obviously don't want to use it. And this is also what's at the moment more difficult to determine. There is actually quite high resolution already on the containers, on the structural determination of the containers. But it's at the moment, we are still working sort of in many ways on these interiors. So it's quite interesting to do it this way around. And this is, again, what uh, our experimental collaborators brought to the table. And here is the answer. Yes, it can. It can actually predict it. So let's have a look at it. So let's see where the vertices are sitting. So these are the outermost vertices of these point arrays that encode the layouts. And they are scaled to the outside of the virus. And everything else is then packaged in parcel. We cannot rescale bits and pieces individually because the symmetry group places every vertex with respect to every other. A single vertex is actually correlated via these symmetry groups to any other vertex in the set. And now have a look. See up these internal points here how they're not only picking up the symmetry correctly, but also the radial extension of the structure. So they are telling you basically um, where the density is sitting and also in which way the density is realized. So it's because, as you've seen already earlier, if I have a given symmetry, like acrosidal symmetry, it can occur in different forms. It can occur as an icosahedron, as a dodecahedron. So there are different incarnations of the symmetry. But what this is doing, it's on top of actually picking up the radial distribution. It is also picking up features, structure features of the shapes. So that was quite interesting for us. And now we had then thought, well, if that's true, then it should hold for other viruses as well. And um, if, it's, if it's really a phenomenon, this is not a one-off, but that is meaningful for viruses in general. So we set out to look at this virus here which is pyacotta virus. And the reason why we chose that one next is because it is known that it has a very interesting dodecahedral cage structure formed from viral RNA close to the protein container. And we were wondering if this theory is able to predict this. 
So here you see a movie that superimposes the point array again on the structure. The virus is rotating first from the outside, so I should also say that these vertices are sitting at what are local symmetry axes. So that's quite remarkable that in a finite set of layouts, there is at all a member available that would pick out these protruding features on the outside that are presented to the, to the cell. But now we are zooming in. So we are first zooming in and we are zooming out again. And then we will actually strip everything away except six proteins so that you can more closely see what's going on with these six proteins. So here are only six proteins from the container. And we are also showing now what we call a cartoon representation. I hope you can see it well. It seems to come out quite light, actually. Um, so it's a cartoon representation where you see the individual helices and sheets. And now so the other vertices will come in one by one as layers for you to appreciate where they would go. And one thing I would want to draw your attention to is that actually the thickness of the container is determined or delimited by these points. So this is one of the features we can learn. Or when it's tilting towards you, you can also see that these what we call trimers, these building blocks of threes, that they are actually determined or delimited in some way in by this mathematics. And now every point that comes in from now is predictive. And I that is really a shame because now comes the meat of the story and it should not let me down on this, so I'm afraid this I have to show you because this is I absolutely want to see that. Because now we are going to the regime where we haven't used any knowledge about the structure at all. Yeah. So this is a piece of the associated RNA cage. This is basically this cage structure I told you about that holds a third of the viral RNA. And you see our vertices are sitting in what we call the minor groups. So the RNA has these helical structures, so it's basically a bit like this. And it's sitting in, obviously this has the same groups, not minor and major groups, but if it's sort of a proper piece of RNA, it has these minor and major groups. And the points sit inside of it, so they are really delimiting this container, and this, if you think about it for a moment, actually has very, very strong implications for the biology of it. Let me get back to my... Okay. Yeah. For the biology, because actually what it tells you is that all structural components are correlated by the symmetry principle. And for instance, the thickness of the container and the measures of this cage are also fixed with respect to each other by that symmetry group. So basically <coughs> there is what we call a molecular scaling principle that we haven't been aware of before, which actually correlates different components. And that's quite important for us to know because if you sort of tinker with one bit of the structure of the virus, it has implications for other bits. So it is really very, very important for us to know if there are these correlations happening. And here you see again an illustration of the fact that all these radial levels are um, related with each other. And you can explore this. So for this particular virus, again, we have a pimer session set up outside. And you can rotate and you can see it yourself, see how the vertices fall in the minor groups, see where they are all sitting, um, just to appreciate really how much of this structure is actually orchestrated. So this principle of genetic economy goes much further. It extends from the protein layout actually to the full 3D organization of the structure. And now I can zoom in again with my mathematical microscope on that virus which had only five-fold clusters everywhere. This cancer-causing virus which, for instance, papilloma virus is one of them or SV40. There are a lot of different types of viruses following this layout. And you see that actually these point arrays now say something, tell us something about the thickness of these different clusters and also on the positioning of their arms and so on and so far. So it's really a lot of extra information that we can exploit um, in many ways. And I should say, because we're here 
obviously to talk about mathematics and the mathematics underlying the biology, I should say that this mathematical problem is very much related to an exciting problem regarding the packaging of polyhedra. So there has been in 2009 a very, very nice paper from colleagues in Princeton who looked at dense packing of polyhedra and that is an MD simulation and looked at what sort of packing structures would be dense where you could uh, put the most amount of polyhedron if you want in the small, smallest amount of space. And these symmetry groups we're doing here actually encode dense packings because they are sort of intuitively, as we've seen, this movement of polyhedra and grouping of polyhedra. So I'm not saying that every one of ours gives me a packing of polyhedra. Some are overlapping, but the dense packing, uh, the densest packings are part of this picture. So basically what they determined as the densest packing is actually part of this framework, of this affine extended symmetry framework. And you, you, you see them basically come out of this um, from, from the symmetry group point of view. And that's again something we invite you to explore outside. So we have three packing structures available for you to look at and uh, basically move around and, and remove individual uh, components and bring them back in. So that's, that's quite interesting. The other thing what you can, so I'm basically going through what you can learn with this mathematics once it's at your disposal. Juliana is with us here, Juliana Indelicat is a postdoc in my group. She's looking at structural transitions. So viruses, some viruses undergo structural transitions that are important for infection. For instance, they undergo an expansion of their protein containers, so the rearrangement of the proteins which leads to the fact that channels are being opened through which genomic material can be ejected. And for such viruses, it is important to understand these expansion events. And we can do this actually based on the mathematics here. So you need kind of a framework in which you can study the, po the possible rearrangements. And one way is to do it again in the context of these affine extended symmetry groups and these point arrays and their relation to lattices and quasi-lattices. So this is another sort of uh, foothold we are getting by having this unified theory uh, in the background that we can use for, for viruses. And here you see basically under expansion how one of these um, clusters is sort of becoming a bit more extended and flatter um, uh, in, in this process. Also what I would like to say is that this is not only working in biology, this must new mathematics is also working in chemistry. And Jess, in the, see in the back there, in my group has done PhD work on this, is basically to show that what we call fullerenes or carbon onions, so these are carbon cages, nested carbon cages, these can also be described with the same type of mathematics. So what I want, what I'm saying there is to give you a feeling for the fact that it's quite a fundamental piece of mathematics that is not just sort of uh, make an impact in biology, but actually you can use it in very different areas and find applications for it. So now I would like to draw your attention, probably not have the sound because I want to make the sound actually. Um, now comes a very, very important aspect of virology and this is the formation of the protein containers. So we want to understand how do these containers form in the first place. Now that we've understood their structures and we understand what the kind of boundary, geometric boundary condition on their formation are, we would like to see what's actually going on. And for a long, long while what people have studied in this context is what we say protein assembly. So these containers we said are formed from protein. So people took individual proteins and what Art Olsen is doing in this movie, he's just taking basically building blocks like this, which have magnetic sides. He breaks this apart, puts it in a test tube here, he shakes it. And after a while, due to these attractive forces and the random sort of meeting of these different building blocks, it will indeed come out, as you've seen in this example, again as such a shape, right? And this tells us a lot about protein assembly, but, and this is again quite exciting and very, very recent work, and this is actually Eric who's also here, it's Eric's work, Eric Dijkman, a postdoc in my group, is to understand this assembly process better and especially the impact of the RNA on this assembly process. I should say there is a fundamentally different way in which 
RNA viruses and DNA viruses assemble. So DNA viruses often use a so-called packaging motor and stuff the DNA inside of the preformed container after the event of assembly. Whereas these viruses actually do what we say, what we call co-assembly. They basically assemble the proteins and the RNA at the same time. This is again bacteriophage MS2, and I'd like to illustrate the ideas underlying this um, to you here because it's quite instructive for what you can learn again from the correlation um, of the RNA layout and the proteins. So here's the picture you've seen before. The outside is the protein container, and inside we have the two um, layers, uh, two uh, shells of RNA. And the outside, basically, if I look at it, is a particle like this, um, which is formed from two different types of building blocks. And immediately underneath is the RNA in a cage. You've seen the dodecahedral cage with pyrocotta virus. This cage looks slightly different from this. It has small pentagonal faces here and large triangular faces. It's again a polyhedron with icosahedral symmetry, but it looks slightly different. And this is immediately underneath. And now what we actually want to understand is in how many ways can this particle form? So the particle, again, is formed from these two different types of shapes. And underneath we have the, the protein layer. And when it's forming, we have to explain in some way how the RNA, which is again a bit like my slinky here, yeah? So how this shape, ooh, we have to do assembly afterwards. Um, so how this kind of RNA, piece of RNA, is actually um, forming this container. And as you can guess, because at every uh, corner point here, you have three edges coming out. You cannot populate all edges because you have a long piece of string, you have a long piece of slinky. So when I meet a corner point, I can only go along another edge of it. So basically, the question is, so which ones are populated? Which ones are the one that the virus is actually using? And in order to do that, you can use graph theory and you can use a co correlation between the protein layer and the RNA. So what you see here, again, is the idea we had at the beginning of this talk when we looked at how we do a planar embedding of an icosahedron. So this is basically taking this spherical particle, mapping it on the surface of an icosahedron, so relative to the axis of the icosahedron, cut it open, put it flat on the, sc on the screen, and if I do that, you see here these little romp shapes, which are representing these two different types of building blocks. So the here is now actually quite an interesting example how you have to break mathematics and information from biology. So you need to know a bit more about the system. For instance, in solution, if you have a test tube, the first thing that is built are these proteins, and these proteins form these building blocks that we call dimers because they are formed from two individual proteins. And these dimers are originally symmetric. So they look the same. You see here basically what you call a loop, FG loop, on both sides for both dimers looks exactly the same. But in order to form these five-fold axes, what we need to achieve is that some of those loops actually flip back because only then there is enough room around the five-fold axis to accommodate the building block. And the virus does this in a very cunning way. Within this genomic sequence of RNA, there are so-called stem loops. A stem loop looks a bit like this. This is what we call base pairing, so it's, it looks a bit like a hairpin, if you want. This is basically your long piece of RNA has fold, folded up onto itself and base paired, so little loops like this. And these tops of these loops, they bind to the symmetric dimers and make them asymmetric. So we know that this is the mechanism, and Eric and my group has worked on showing that it is a sequence non-specific, which means any piece of the sequence can do it as long as it binds in the right binding pockets. So it can be used multiple times in the viral assembly process. And now a picture emerges, because what you know is in order to have efficient assembly, the virus wants to extend these stem loops underneath the locations of these asymmetric dimers. These asymmetric dimers, however, sit 
precisely on top of these vertices of this polyhedral shell. So they are actually immediately underneath there. So this tells us that when the RNA forms this container, it has to visit every vertex precisely once in order to extend the stem loop, it's in its interest to do so, because that would help it switch the symmetric into the required asymmetric conformers, uh, building blocks, um, at, at those places. But that makes it now exciting for the mathematician, because if I have a polyhedron and I look for a path, because you can see, you can look at the uh, thing that the RNA is a path, so kind of on the polyhedron, to look for a path that visits every vertex precisely once, there's a name <coughs> for it. It's called a Hamiltonian path. So again, with graph theoretical methods, we can go ahead and we can actually determine the number of those and can actually classify these assembly pathways, sort of these assembly lines, the order in which these building blocks come in and where they come in, by classifying Hamiltonian paths. And we've done that and we had shown that they are over 40,500 of these, and we went back to our experimental colleagues and said, look, this is still quite a large number. Can you give us some more information that we can use in the modeling here, because there must be something more. And then people in Leeds did something really, really clever. They did a five-fold reconstruction of the particles. So usually, people do icosahedral reconstructions, which means that they superimpose many different pictures in order to enhance the resolution. We talked about this at the beginning, where we said, because the resolution is so, so not so good on an individual picture, I have to use a lot of them and superimpose them. But the price you usually pay is that you therefore do what we call icosahedral averaging. You have all these icosahedral views on top of each other, so you wash out any feature that's non-icosahedral. But these people have done something really clever because there is something in this virus which is called a maturation protein. It's a single copy of a protein that sits on a five-fold axis and you can actually locate it and you can do your averaging only around the fi one five-fold axis that's defined by this protein. So they could and basically get, get more information about the structure and not wash out with icosahedral averaging. And they can tell us a few pieces of information that we could use. The first thing they said to us as well, we know from biochemical studies that the two ends of the RNA bind to the so-called maturation protein. And we go away and say, aha, so we only need Hamiltonian cycles and pseudocycles. Everything else can't happen. So this brings us down from over 40,000 options to 66, which is quite dramatic, actually. And then we used the information about the kinetics of assembly. I won't go into every gory detail, but we know something about the assembly intermediates and the energetics of the, um, of the kinetics of assembly, and used this to be able to narrow it down to actually three options, one of which we can show is the most probable. So we were actually able to, in this way, in this sort of interdisciplinary effort involving the biochemist, biophysics, bioinformatics, graph theory, to actually like, it's a bit like people dub it CSI in New York, but the new we have in brackets because we're in New York, we were actually able to narrow this down. And that just won us recently a little research highlight in March. So to, to be able to show for the first time actually how does the RNA sit in this asymmetric, what's the asymmetric organization, how does it sit in this polyhedral cage? Yeah. So to determine for the first time the asymmetric organization of the RNA within such a particle. And I hope this gives you a bit of a flavor for what math mathematics can do for you if you also be willing to talk to your colleagues in different disciplines and you use bits and pieces of information from different, um, from different disciplines. So what I hope I could show you today is that with this mathematics, we have been able to crystallize out some fundamental structural principles underlying viruses, and also hopefully I could show you that we use this information in many ways to learn more about viral function, so not just the structure of the virus, but how do viruses work, how do viruses infect their hosts. And again, I can't stress this enough, this is really an integrative, we say, interdisciplinary research, because at many stages throughout the work, we go back to our collaborators and say, look, that's how far the math now gets us, can you give us something more at that stage? And it's really, really exciting, I must say. It's, it's, it's a wonderful area to work in. And I should say also, 
a big, big thank you to my research group. I'm so lucky to have these eight people around. They're wonderful people. We are actually, uh, it's, a, it's a joy every day to come to work with, with this group. And we are, as I said, we're looking at virus structure from all sorts of, and virus assembly and evolution from all sorts of aspects. And yeah, and I'd also like to thank our sponsors. And if someone here is interested in a PhD opportunity, we just got a Wellcome Trust funded program for PhD training on the interface between different disciplines. So if anybody's interested in this, targeted towards infectious diseases, then uh, please talk to us. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Ryden, for a fantastic talk. Ryden will take questions. <coughs> I've got You're some very questions happy to, yes. And every question is a good question, don't worry. I mean, this is because, you know, sometimes people think maybe it's too trivial for me to ask. There's never anything too trivial, so you, you can do it. I know it's a lot to take in one go. Oh, yes, In the slides before, you show the virus yeah. and the RNA molecule, uh -huh. you know, the path. Which is like this one or the one previous? Yeah, this one. Yeah. Empty space inside, it's filled with RNA molecule. This if it's a empty, bit. that means that the... No, it is a very, very good question. And you put your finger precisely on something I glossed over. So there were these two shells of RNA, as we've seen on one of the previous um, slides. And what actually is happening, what I'm showing you here with this pass, is basically more or less the rough layout without what we call the secondary structure, which means more of these stem roots. So what we actually believe is happening, and I'm going to get some chalk from here to draw it for you, is that when the particle builds up the outer layer, at some point it is putting more RNA in form of a stem loop into the inner layer. It's continuing to build up the outer layer. It's putting more inside to the inner layer, and so on and so forth. And this inner layer, later on, forms this interior shell that you're seeing. So the reason why mathematically you can neglect it to, when you're answering this question about the outer shell is that because it's always coming back to the same place where it dipped to the inner shell. So we are just saying, if I want to understand the path outside, it's good enough to close it here and take it away because uh, it's just like a little detour but it's arriving back at the same place. So mathematically, therefore, I can just consider the outside. But if I want to see the full picture, then I have to be quite aware. And what we see in the cryo-EM is that this process happens around the five-foot axis. So it's dipping down to the inner shell, as we say, on the five-foot axis. And there are really interesting experiments when you reassemble, as we say, with shorter RNA fragments, if we cut pieces of the RNA and do the assembly again, because then we see, under certain circumstances, that the inner shell will vanish completely. And this is to say, it then still tries to make up for it and certainly form the outer shell as much as it can, because it needs this to do these conformation changes between the building blocks. But um, depending on how sharp it is, it will stuff less inside. Also, if there is only a partial occupation site in an eicosidly average situation, you would not see it because it would be very floppy. It would not be held in place, and you only see things that where the signal is sort of enhanced in different views. And that is not the case if something is very floppy and appears on different pictures, sort of in different orientations. But bottom line is, yes, you have an inner shell and the intact particle fed from the outside, from the five foot vertices, and then held. Um, this electrostatic interaction in place as a shell. It's a very good question, actually. In your work, have you found that there is any correlation between the types of symmetry groups and the uh, effects of the virus in terms of whether they are uh, aggressive or passive? Um, aggressive or passive is very difficult to say. It tells me something about the structural features. So for instance, what is the outside that is seen in the infection process by the cell or by the receptors? But it doesn't tell me whether it's more aggressive or not. This I can't tell. But it gives me a very, very strong sort of 
control over certain parts of its features. And it, I know the virus has an interest, if you wish, to keep those features intact because these are best with respect to the symmetry. So then the strategy would, would, would be in order to inhibit those viruses to tinker with those areas. So this is the way in which we're using it. But I could not say, like by looking at the model, whether it's, it's sort of um, a very aggressive virus or not. Yeah. So. Oh, sorry, yes, please. Yeah. I'm sorry, this might be a little bit stupid question. No, how does that in the structure help to cure the virus? This is a, an excellent question. So, in many, many ways, so first of all, indirectly, if structure helps you to understand mechanisms like these expansion events, which you might want to inhibit, then it allows us to understand how the building blocks come together to form the container, then we can come up with strategies that inhibit these formations or these particular pathways. Or with the so-called immunodominant epitopes, which are sort of the areas on the outside that are the first contact with the object it's going to infect. So if I know that there are certain areas that are actually less prone to being changed, then these are the ones I can target. Because you see, the biggest problem for us when we want to get antivirus therapeutics is that there are mutations. So whenever you have something that works, next generation it's not working anymore. But if you know the underlying principles that are holding for the virus and all its mutations, then you can hope to develop something that is actually good <coughs> also after mutation, and that's the main, main idea. Yeah, thank you. Very good question. Please. So if we compare this uh, mode of uh, RNA packaging to the DNA containing vir viruses, uh, do they contain more genetic material or less? The, the DNA viruses are much more heavily packaged, more densely packaged. These ones are not quite so densely packaged, right? So there's much less occupation in these RNA viruses. A DNA virus, because of this persistent length of DNA being different from that of an RNA, what very often happens is that you have these so-called packaging motors. They're actually quite exciting on their own. They're sitting on a five-foot vertex in that case, and they're, road, they're, they're sort of bringing the, the DNA in. And this is a more tightly packaged environment, so you see much, much more density inside of there. So there's a big difference, you're right. The, the genome has to be more restrained? And um, when you come, so, okay, I have something again I've glossed over, but I have to explain. If you want to use a global symmetry argument on the whole system, including the proteins and the RNA, you can only do it in the context of co-assembly. Because if it's the context where you first assemble the protein container and the second step bring in the DNA or RNA, then basically the whole system doesn't really underlie the fully extended symmetry group, if you know what I mean. So I would not endeavor with this technology to, to make prediction on the genome organization, a DNA virus that packages in a second step. But RNA viruses are the dominant class. They have so many pathogens, as you know, I mean, from the common cold over polio, over so many, many pathogens. And I, I, yes, I have to say, this <coughs> mathematics works for that particular class. Yeah. Okay, well, let us end now. And thank you, uh, Ryden, again, for a fantastic talk. There are uh, some demonstrations outside, and there are some, also some models for the younger ones to build as well, or for the older ones to build too, if they feel so inclined. So thanks, Ryden. <laughs>